Father, we thank you for the riches that you've given to your church in your son, Jesus. Lord, we know that the inheritance that you've given your church is immeasurably great. The riches are unsearchable, Lord God. But Lord, we desire to lay hold of Jesus Christ as individuals and as your church, Lord. We desire, Lord, to lay hold of the inheritance, Father, that you've given us in your son, that he might be glorified. So, Lord, as we continue to look at the inheritance you've given us in Jesus, the ancient ways, Lord, that you've established for your people, as we continue, Father, to search out, Lord, and plumb the depths, Lord, of who you are in what you've given to us as your church, help us, Father. Help us that what we read, what we hear, not just be words to us or truths, Lord, that that tickle our interest, but Lord, that this be transformational. Lord, that Jesus Christ be glorified increasingly and fully through our lives and through your church. We thank you, Father. I particularly commit today's message, Lord God, that you've given me. I commit it back to you, Father, and pray, Lord, that you would speak to every heart and mind. And above all, Lord God, that what we hear and and listen to and see, Lord, Again, that it change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I've been talking through a number of weeks now about the ancient ways, the ways that God established for his church to walk. Ways which in many ways over the centuries have been lost sight of and ways that need to be regained. And every single one of those ancient ways I have described as the power of something because the kingdom of God is not about words. It's about power. Today, we'll be looking at the power of husbands and wives. The power of husbands and wives. Now, before you say, well, I'm not married, so this is irrelevant to me. Stop right there. Because the fact is that maybe one day you will be married. And even if you're not, the fact is that you can pray for those who are. It's vital and important to pray for marriages, to pray for couples. And one of the reasons for that is that there's much more to marriage, to godly marriage than meets the eye, much more. In times past, when someone was going to get married, it was understood that the the marriage was for the benefit of the whole community. We've sort of lost that in our modern Western culture. We think of marriage as being principally so that the couple themselves can be, can be blessed. And of course, that's true. There's a great blessing in it. But it used to be understood that marriage was designed as a blessing for the whole community. And when we look at the word of God, we see that marriage is designed not just to bless the couple and their family or even their community, but that marriage, godly marriage, has a powerful role in God's purposes for his son Jesus, and for all of creation. Let's face it, he describes the husband and wife relationship as head and body, as being representative of Christ and the church, head and body, an expression of Jesus Christ himself. And let's face it, that God created mankind in order to govern and rule over the whole of his creation, invisible and visible, And the first people that he assigned that task to were Adam and Eve, were a couple. In Jesus, mankind has regained his position that he'd lost of governing and ruling over creation. And of course, the church is called to join in with Jesus in that government. And marriage is designed to demonstrate and impart that truth, not only to the world, the people of the world, but also to the powers, the heavenly powers, angels and demons. And we'll look at that more as we go along. So I hope already you're getting a sense that marriage is a much bigger thing than it's given credit for, and that whether or not you're married, this is relevant to you. Amen. So let's take to heart what we see from the word of God today. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33 is one of the principal passages in the scriptures about marriage and how the marriage should be seen and conducted. Again, 
Take this to heart whether or not you are married and you will be able to pray more effectively for marriages as well as if you are married. You'll be able to engage more fully in God's purposes for your marriage. We're going to dive right in. Uh, Ephesians 5 verses 22 to 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Okay, so what image is being used here? A head and a body. Now, if your body, physical body, was doing its own thing and wasn't following the directions of the head, you would have a problem. The head needs to receive information from the body, your physical body. Your head, your brain needs to receive the information that you get from your senses and so on in your body. But it's still going to be the head that has to decide what to do. And this is why God uses, through Paul, this analogy here with marriage. A healthy body communicates with its head and submits in everything to its head. If your physical body wasn't operating that way, you would have difficulties. But if it is operating that way, then all can be well. So the analogy that's being used is to show what marriage is like, how God's designed it, and Christ's relationship with the church. So if the church is doing its own thing, and not following the head, Jesus, then there's a problem. But if the head, if the church is feeding back, if you like, information to the head, sharing with Jesus, our Lord, our heart, our views, our experiences, our circumstances, our anxieties, whatever it might be, as we share that information with him, he then is able to direct us where we need to go. And in the same way, in marriage, this is how God has designed it to operate that the husband is like the head. He is going to be ultimately the one in the couple who is directing the life of the couple. And the wife is going to be sharing with her husband all the different things that she's thinking, feeling, experiencing in order that he can make good decisions in terms of his headship. So there's a communication that goes back and forth, but ultimately it's the head that's going to make to give the directions. Now, notice that we're told the husband's the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. This is important. Jesus is the saviour of the church. He rescues us. He saves us from peril, calamity, danger, lack, whatever the case might be. And in the same way, God has designed that the husband would be protecting, providing for and in every way necessary, saving his wife from peril, need, etc. So this headship is a good thing. To be a saviour, to have a saviour is a good thing. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. What will help us, um, especially in the climate we live in now, where this would be seen as usually or often as a very archaic way of seeing things, what will help us is to understand the type of word that's being used here for to submit. It's a military term, and it literally means to rank under someone. So as you would if you were in the military and you had a commander, you would go along with what he said. You might not always understand it. You might not even always agree with it. But there'd be a level of trust. He's the commander. And there'd be a level of, well, there would be obedience. That's how the military works. If, it, if obedience breaks down in the military, then the whole thing is, collapses. So this is a very practical instruction. It's not saying you'll always, as a wife, you'll always understand, you'll always agree. But it's saying, but you see it as a military type situation. That you're going to rank under, you're going to place yourself under the authority of your husband because he's the one who's been given the responsibility by the Lord to to direct things. And that makes it very practical then, you know, because you can make that decision in terms of a practical decision of, okay, I'm going to, as I would if I were in the military, so I'm going to go, go along with this. 
Okay, verse 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish or holy and blameless. So now the instructions are shifting from wives to husbands. And notice the first statement is husbands, love your wives. This is the context. This is what God is all about. He's about love. And so proper godly marriage has to be always carried out on the ground of love. Husbands are instructed, love your wives as Christ loved the church. In other words, in the same way that Christ loved the church and with the same kind of love. Husbands, love your wives in the same way as Christ loved the church and with the same kind of love. Not with what you think love is, but with what God says love is. With what Jesus shows that love is. Love your wife in that way. With what the Holy Spirit directs that love is. That's how you're going to love your wife. Why did Jesus Christ love the church and give himself up for her? that he might sanctify her. In other words, that he might take the church and set her apart for God. And similarly, the responsibility of a husband is to love his wife, to give himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, that he might help her to be set apart for God. Set apart from the darkness and living in the light. Set apart from guilt, shame, condemnation, fear, anxiety, and living in the light of the grace and the goodness of Jesus Christ, set apart from the the lies of this world that come in in order to divert and distract and steal, set apart in order to feast on the riches of God and of Jesus, etc. That's to sanctify. So as husbands, we're, we're called to give our, love our wives, give ourselves up for them, that we might help in the process of them being sanctified. And notice this is a responsibility on husbands. It says that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Jesus cleansed the church with his word. He says in John 15, 3, already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. When Jesus was speaking to his disciples, he said, I've spoken these words to you. I've washed you with these words. And so you are clean. Past tense. Done. Right. And so as husbands, as we seek to honor God in loving our wives, we must start from that same starting point that our wives, if they know Jesus, have been washed by Jesus, with the word, and are clean. That's the starting point. And on a practical note, very often what that involves is to remind our wives that they are clean before the Lord. There's an old song by a band called Petra, and it's called Clean. And it says, kneeling in the closet, begging daily bread, there might be a skeleton hanging overhead. Where are my accusers? Nowhere to be found. They all drop their stones when the master came around because I'm clean, clean, clean before my Lord. Like a spotless lamb, I'm blameless in his sight with no trace of wrong left to right. I'm clean, clean, clean. So already you are clean because of the word that Jesus has spoken to you. Husbands, we are called to love our wives, give ourselves up for them that we might aid in their sanctification, reminding them that they are clean before the Lord. And that will often mean that we engage in the great privilege of taking the word of God and washing our wives with this word so they can remember and be reminded of their cleanness before him. It goes on in this passage we've just read, so that Christ might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy 
and blameless. So again, we're looking at what Jesus does for the church and what the husband is called to do for the wife, to present her to himself in splendor, holy and blameless. What does it mean to be holy, to be whole, to be complete in Christ and with Christ? What does it mean to be blameless? It means to stand in the righteousness of Jesus, living in the righteousness of Jesus. It doesn't mean never failing. It means standing in this, I'm blameless before my Lord. I'm righteous in Jesus Christ. So do we see, do we get the sense of, of the, 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 the weighty privilege and responsibility that husbands have in a godly marriage to love our wives with the same love that Christ loves the church, to give ourselves up for them in order that they would be set apart for God, in order that they would know how clean they are before the Lord through what Jesus has spoken in his word. And so that they would be constantly reminded of their wholeness and completeness in Christ and their righteousness in him, that they might live in that, in the light of that. Okay. Moving on, verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. That's another weighty statement. You have to let the richness and strength of this really sink in. Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Why? Because she is your own body. You've been made one. What God has joined together. You've been made one. Head, like the head and the body that we saw earlier. Your head and your body are connected. They're part of one being. And similarly, Christ and the church, one being, united. And this this is the same within marriage. He who loves his wife loves himself. Well, that's obvious why, because we've just seen one body. You know, we have this saying, oh, she's my she's my other half. (laughs) Some would say better half with appropriate deference. The husband will say of the wife, she's my better half. And the wife will say of the husband, he's my better half. That whole idea comes from the the, the idea that, that you're one. You're one through God. Verse 29 to 30. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it, cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Do you understand the dignity and the love that is accorded to us by Jesus because we're part of his body? He nourishes us, he cherishes us because we are members of his body. Now, Christ nourishes and cherishes the church because the church is his own body. And in a similar way, husbands are called and it's within our nature in Christ to nourish and cherish our wife because we are members together now of of one body being married. He said no one ever hated his own flesh. Do you hate your own flesh? Some people do, don't they? We've seen an epidemic of self-harm in the West in the last however many years. Something's really, really, really wrong when a person hates their own body to the extent that they're going to start harming it. This is how Satan's lies have come in to try and take away from how God designed things, that we would love our own body, that we would value and cherish it as something given by God and precious to him. So if you hate your own flesh... In any respect, something's wrong. And I pray that God will reveal his love to you. Because God created us soul and body and he loves us completely. So even if in a tiny way you treat yourself badly in that way, then may the Lord's love for you become more obvious to you. Verse 31 to 32. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. 
This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So the two shall become one. The two shall become one. That's marriage. And it's a spiritual union as well as a physical one. Why? Because we are not just physical beings. We're body and soul. So in a marriage that God has ordained, that God's hand is upon, there's a oneness that comes about of body and of soul. This is why Paul warns in 1 Corinthians 6, he warns against sexual immorality. He says, shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? We are members of Christ's body. And he's literally using this language. Shall I take the members of Christ's body and unite them with a prostitute, making them then members of that prostitute? I know it's, it's heavy stuff to, to be saying, but I need to bring this point in so that we can understand that the depth of what's going on when those unions take place. There's a sharing of body and of soul. There's a spiritual union of some kind that's going on. And therefore, it should be kept how God ordained it. But looking on the positive side, on the bright side, if you like, in a godly marriage, the two have become one. And that's a beautiful thing. This mystery, he says, is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Now, is Paul backing down and saying, well, I've been diving deep here and there's no way you're really going to understand it. So I'm going to back off now and, and say, well, really, I'm just talking about Christ and the church. No, the word used for mystery here doesn't mean what we think of a mystery as being nowadays. We think, oh, a mystery means something that's beyond knowledge. You can't know it. You can't understand it. But in the way that Paul used it, it's something that's knowable, but only through revelation from God. This is the mystery, the mystery of marriage, the mystery of godly marriage and of how that reflects Christ in the church is knowable, but it's only knowable by revelation, by the Holy Spirit revealing that to us. He says that this mystery of a man leaving his father and mother, holding fast to his wife, the two becoming one flesh, refers to Christ and the church. Now, how does it refer to Christ and the church? In this way, godly marriage is a spiritual declaration. It imparts God and his truth to the creation around. Remember earlier, I said that marriage is designed not just to bless the couple themselves, but to bless their family, to bless their community, to bless their nation, to bless God himself as he sees his son Jesus reflected in that marriage. It's also designed to be instructional to the heavenly powers. So godly marriage is a declaration in all those spheres. And it doesn't just speak something, it imparts something. It brings something of God into all those situations. Do you understand the difference between declaring something and imparting something? When you declare something, you're speaking forth a truth. When you impart something... That truth that you're speaking or communicating, something of that truth is received and becomes available to whoever you're imparting it to. It has the opportunity to become part of who they are. It's an impartation. So godly marriage imparts as well as declares something to the creation. And this is important because God designed mankind to govern the creation. So I want to look briefly at four short points as to how marriage refers to Christ and the church and is this declaration and this impartation from God to the creation. Number one, the oneness of marriage demonstrates the oneness of Christ and his church. And that's what we've seen in this whole passage. Paul is saying to married couples, look, there's something precious you have here. The way you conduct your relationship is designed to reflect and show how Jesus Christ relates to his body, the church, and the oneness that the church and Christ live in. So the oneness of marriage demonstrates the oneness of Christ and his church, and as I've said, demonstrates it 
in all those different spheres, to the couple, to the community, to the angelic powers, and to God the Father himself. Now, all of those spheres need to see godly marriage, to see Christ, to see Christ demonstrated and imparted. And this is why, point two, every aspect of marriage is so important, from the finest details to the biggest areas. Every aspect is so important because it's designed to declare and impart something spiritual to the creation. Point three, this is why the battle is so intense at times within marriage to honour God and to do things in a godly way. But also the glory is so intense when things are done in a godly way because of what's being demonstrated. Fourthly, marriage is a living picture of Christ, head and body, Christ and the church, a living picture. I'm going to push this point for a moment, and you might need to seek the Lord more on what I'm getting at here. Mankind is destined to rule all of creation, invisible creation and visible creation. This is the future that God has designed for mankind. And there's plenty of scriptural backup for that. If you want to look later, Hebrews 2, 5 to 8, Psalm 8, virtually the whole psalm, touch on this. Mankind is destined to rule all of creation, to rule with Christ, who's the firstborn from the dead and the firstborn of all creation. And godly marriage demonstrates that. Christ and his church ruling and governing in the creation. This was supposed to start with Adam and Eve. From the beginning, it was that way. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. God made man in his image, male and female, he created them and he blessed them. And he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the works of my hands. So from the very beginning, it was this way. Adam and Eve, the first couple, were designed to rule over creation. And then along with them, every human being that was born after was designed to join in that rulership over the invisible and visible creation. The fall happened, Adam sinned, etc. Christ came, he reinstituted and, and regained that position of authority for mankind. And then through the new birth, he brings us into the opportunity to govern and rule with him. And the married couple, as I keep saying today, is designed to be a living picture of Christ and his government over the creation. So these are high, high-powered things, deep truths, which I encourage you to explore in the Lord. But Paul understands that these are deep truths, profound ones, and much of which can only come by revelation. And so in verse 33, at the end of the passage, he sort of brings it back to a place where wherever we are in our walk, and if we're married in our marriages, we can put our hand to what God wants. Verse 33, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects or reverences her husband. So he's saying, okay, I've shown you these things, the glory and beauty of Christ and his church reflected in marriage. However, wherever you're at with understanding all of the depth of that, here's what you can do and should do. Husbands, so love your wife as yourself. The word so here, so love your wife. In, in other words, in this way, in the way we've just seen, Love your wife in this way. Love with what kind of love? The word here is agape. It's the kind of love that God has for mankind. That regardless of what's going on with the, the other person, you're going to love them. You're going to value and honor them. And you're going to seek what's best for them, no matter what it costs you. That's agape. That's the love that husbands are called to love their wives with. Agape love. No matter what it costs me, no matter what, what, what the reaction is, I'm going to love my wife with the kind of love that seeks the best for her. Full stop. That's agape love. And I'm going to love myself that way too, because he says, love your wives as you, as you love yourself. 
and then let the wife see to it that she respects, or actually the word is reverences, her husband. Now, see to it. Why does it say that? Because there has to be an intentionality to this. It's easy to forget how we should conduct ourselves in in life. So he's saying, wives, don't forget to do this, to, to respect, to reverence your husband. Now, again, I know I'm speaking to a cultural context where, you know, red flags would be going up all over the place on the stuff I'm saying, but I hope you can see it's nothing more than the word of God. I hope that we have no qualms in being bold about the word of God. I hope we have no, I hope there's absolutely not even a hint in our hearts and souls of apology for the word of God. Because last time I checked, God does not apologize for himself, for the way he's designed things, and for the glory and love and beauty that flow when things are done his way. So I'm speaking into that cultural context, but this is God's word, praise God. So let the wife see that she reverences her husband. The word here, I looked it up, went back to the Greek, And the word is actually reverential fear. It's the same word used for fearing the Lord in a lot of contexts. And that there's something to that. There's a reverence. There's a reverential fear that we have in our relationship with the Lord or that we're designed to have. And wives are called to reverence their husband with that same type of reverential fear. I'll leave that with you to pray about what that looks like and how that plays out. But there it is. That's what God says. And I think the more we divest ourselves of the world's hang ups and preoccupations and suspicions and fears, the more we'll see that actually God knows what he's talking about here. The beauty of this is the power of husbands and wives is that God designed them to rule together. Adam and Eve were called to subdue the earth and have dominion over the works of God's hands. Just like Jesus Christ has called his church to govern and rule the invisible and the visible creation along with him. The dignity again and the love that's accorded to us by Jesus in that is astounding. And this is what marriage is a picture of. So When you think of that head and that body, Jesus and his church, strong, dignified, governing in love and in truth and in light over God's works. And then you think marriage, godly marriage is designed to look just like that. What a beautiful interplay between husband and wife, between Christ and his church. May God elevate our view of marriage and of Christ and his church and what we're called to with him. You may recall a few weeks ago, I spoke on the power of spiritual government and how the church has actually been given authority to govern in this world through the Holy Spirit. We're in a period of time at the moment where we don't see everything actually operating as it should under the authority of Jesus Christ, but we do see him who through death, tasted death for all of us, crowned with glory and honour. And we're, we're here in order to learn to govern and rule with him. Marriage is key in that. So may God not only elevate our view of it, but may he enable us, if we are married, to live that out in our own personal context. If we're not married, may he stir our hearts to pray in a way that we never have before, for couples and marriages, Christian and non-Christian, understanding the significance and the weight that this has in God's plan to make Jesus Christ visible and evident as the centerpiece of the whole of creation and the one to whom it belongs. Praise God. I'm going to leave it there. I do intend to continue on this theme. We're going to look at the last chapter in Proverbs, which speaks to men and women. And then, Lord willing, with the couples in the church, then I'm planning to do some extra sort of teaching or times of sharing that we can delve a bit more into what God has for all this. So let's be praying that God will direct all that as he wishes.